Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. The Chief of the General Staff's call for a citizen army has kicked off a national debate. While Downing Street says conscription's not on the table, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson has called for the return of national service. We'll hear how that's worked out for Sweden. The armed forces get people who ordinarily would never have entertained any sort of thoughts of serving in the military and I think this is a, a, a big answer to the recruitment crisis. Also on SITREP, Iran's axis of resistance. What is the network of militias behind daily strikes against US troops in the Middle East? Some of these groups have almost like party functions with uh, like a political wing. Some of them just really have a military wing. But this is a big business for Iran. They, they really poured billions into supporting the different types of groups. And as President Putin visits the small, isolated Russian enclave of Kaliningrad, we explain why some think it could be the place where war with NATO begins. The fear is that if there could be some kind of lightning push of Russian troops through Belarus and to Kaliningrad, it would cut off the Baltic states from the rest of NATO. Zidrev with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. Uh, Mike, you were very clear last week that General Sir Patrick Sanders was not talking about conscription, bringing back national service when he talked about training up a citizen army. But we're now hearing that in a brainstorming session, he's been thinking about something entirely different. Yes, and I, I think the MOD is talking about this sort of thing all the time. Um, what's come through now is that they were thinking about maybe offering gap year students, people out of school before they go to university, the idea of doing a month, maybe more than a month with the military, give them a taste of it, see if they like it, see if that interests them in joining the reserves, not joining up to the regulars, but joining the reserves. And that that is sensible because, you know, when, when we talk about people who have served being on the reserve list up to the age of 55, that's not really very real realistic it's much more realistic not to get older people who've got jobs and families and are, are less fit probably but to get younger people who are teenagers interested in the reserves because they're the ones you really want so i think this is quite a an interesting idea and also i think young people at the age of 17 18 they want to challenge themselves against you know physical as well as mental um, tasks and i think that there may be some real mileage in this also as a, a way of creating a, bit, a big a better sense of national mobilisation of, of uh, not patriotism, but of commitment, of, of responsibility mm. for our society. Yes, it's quite a thought. Well, in the public debate it's provoked, the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson is among those who've advocated reintroducing compulsory national service. But it doesn't exactly look like a popular idea with the public. In a YouGov opinion poll, more than a third of under 40 said they'd refuse to serve even in the event of a world war. But could that change? And are we missing a trick that could help the forces as they struggle with recruitment? Sweden reintroduced compulsory national service, but only for selected candidates in 2017. It's a route that Germany's defence minister is also seriously considering. Elizabeth Braw is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council in 2019. She wrote a paper for the defence think tank RUSI examining how national service in Scandinavian countries could be a model for the UK. Sweden used to have national service like most European countries uh, during the Cold War and back then it was really uh, mandatory for every able-bodied man and, and almost everybody served as a result. Then Sweden suspended military service in 2009. Uh, my youngest brother was actually one of the very last people to serve in that final cohort. Sweden then moved to an all-volunteer force and Recently, it discovered that that didn't really work very well. It had the same problem as the UK, namely recruitment. So what Sweden then decided to do was to use the Norwegian model, which is where everybody is assessed, everybody within every uh, year group is assessed, and then the armed forces select a small number of those for their different uh, regiments. And, and that is the way it works in Sweden now. So you can still sign up to serve uh, as a professional soldier, but on top of that, People are young people are selected out of every year group uh, for the the different positions that the different regiments want to fill. And does it apply to women as well as men? 
It does. So I, for example, have a son who is 20 years old, actually almost 21, and I have a girl who is uh, almost 18. And if they are Swedish citizens, but if they were to live in Sweden, they would be part of, of this selection. Really, the, the big advantage of this is that everybody is assessed. And it could be that, that you come from a family that has no exposure to the armed forces. And then when you're assessed and, and possibly selected and do military service, you, you realize that you quite like it and you're quite good at it. And, and so the armed forces get people who ordinarily would never have entertained any sort of thought of serving in the military. And I think this is a, a, a big answer to the recruitment crisis within uh, the armed forces, not just in, in Sweden, uh, but in the UK and other countries as well. And how many people are selected? It depends on how many are needed each year. So it, can, it started with just a couple of thousand since then it has been increased. But if you look at, at Norway, which has uh, the model that, that Sweden has copied, it's about one sixth out of every year group. That is a substantial number for the Norwegians, yet they don't get anybody who doesn't want to be there because at 17%, you don't have to force anybody. You choose the people who are really good and who have the aptitude and who have the interest. And you can discover during the assessment process that, that you have the interest. So how does the selection process actually work? So there is, it starts with a general assessment, sort of remote, uh, online, and then based on that, you're going to the second round. I got to observe one of the second rounds in, in Norway a few years ago. It really is extraordinary. So you see, you know, a bunch of young men and women sort of marching uh, around to, you know, to the nearest tent and then doing some sort of exercise. And it's just, it looks like a school trip, but uh, obviously in the military setting, they have instructors there who assess them. And uh, based on those grades, you either you make it or, or you don't make it. And what happens if someone is selected and really doesn't want to do it? Is it just tough? Do they have to do it? Or is it like the Netherlands where enforcement has been abandoned? In theory, they could be forced to serve, but there are so many people who want to serve that the armed forces wouldn't select somebody who uh, absolutely had, who, who was adamantly opposed to serving. And that is the great thing about having selective military service that, that you really uh, you turn something that is uh, theoretically mandatory, you turn it into something that is so desirable that people forget that it's mandatory. It's essentially turning lemons into lemonade. You only need a small percentage. And yes, you can force them if you like, but because it's so selective, it's so prestigious that virtually anybody you select will be absolutely chuffed to be selected. It's quite common in Norway that the parents will try to lobby for that teenagers to be selected. Hmm. It's interesting that you said that in Sweden, it was difficult to get people to sign up when it was voluntary. But then when it became national service, people wanted to be selected. How's it gone down in the public? It has been very popular. And it really is brilliant psychology. The competitive element, the pride in serving, and then the sort of uh, uncertainty of, you know, will my child be selected or mm. who is selected this year? Uh, so credit to the Norwegians for having thought up this model and, uh, and to Sweden for adopting it. And finally, the whole issue is back in the headlines here in the UK since the chief of the general staff spoke of the need for a citizen army in the UK. What did you make of General Sir Patrick Sanders and what he said? Well, he's absolutely right. And I have to say, I wonder if he, if he has... Uh, drawn a little bit of inspiration from Norway since his mother is Norwegian and he speaks fluent Norwegian. But regardless of where he got the information, he's absolutely right. And, and it's not just a matter of having the whole country involved in the armed forces. It's a matter of having the whole country or as many people as possible, a critical mass involved in keeping the country safe and doesn't have to be in the armed forces. It can be in other parts of society. It can be in civil preparedness or civic preparedness um, responding to to, to natural disasters. And, and when I, I've always thought, you know, when there's flooding in a place like Somerset, why is it that the British Army has to come in and pile sandbags? Wouldn't it be possible for, for locals to have that sort of training? The same is true with, with any sort of crisis. When COVID struck, the government did set up an NHS army for, for people to help one another. What if we set up something like that before crisis strikes so that people know what to do uh, when that crisis occurs? 
And so he's, uh, General Sanders is absolutely right about the need for more uh, societal involvement in keeping the country safe. Uh, and it, it, it should just go beyond the armed forces because the armed forces specialize in military defense. And today, keeping the country safe involves so many other parts as well. Elizabeth Broad, great to speak to you. And thanks for that. I never knew that Patrick Sanders' mum was Norwegian. Interesting to know. You learn something new every day. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mike, uh, there seems to be a, a very different cultural attitude to national service in many of our neighbouring countries. Do you think the public in the UK could be one round? Not, I don't think, to the idea of compulsion. As Elizabeth was saying there, you've got to dress compulsion up as something else. And, you know, go back on what we said before. If you date the British Army from 1660, then it's 364 years old. And we've only had compulsory national service for 25 of those 364 years. So the idea of voluntarism is deep in our DNA. But I think the, the idea of, of stressing the benefits, the benefits afterwards, the, you know, the benefits to your job prospects and things like that are very important. And also, I think we do have to try to reverse this imbalance between, you know, we talk a lot about individual rights these days, and we don't talk so much about responsibilities to our society and our civic culture. And I do think we can appeal to a, a growing sense, I think, in the country that we've got mm -hmm. to get, get the balance back between the individual rights that we safeguard very clearly in, in Britain and the sense of responsibilities that has slipped away a bit in the last couple of generations. Well, let's bring in Nicholas Drummond, former Welsh Guards Infantry Officer. Nicholas, uh, good to have you on SIPREP. You were in the room and you spoke to General Sanders after his speech. How do you think he will feel about the debate that's followed his comments? You know, I, I think people misinterpreted his speech. I think he'll be dismayed by that, uh, to miss the main point that he was making, that the army needs to grow in size. He's not calling for conscription, but he's saying that if we don't get a grip of the army as it is now, we would have no alternative but to fall back on conscription. Uh, and that's something that he doesn't want. And that's the mm. real point he was making. So the question then of how the forces feel about the idea of bringing conscripts has, however, been discussed very much in the public domain, whether or not he, may, he didn't mean that, obviously, as you're, you're pointing out. Do you think that could improve capability or just divert effort? Well, as Michael just said, you know, Britain has a very long history of having uh, a professional volunteer army. It's what we had at the beginning of uh, the First World War and at the beginning of the Second World War. The expeditionary forces were primarily uh, volunteers who were very well trained and reasonably equipped, certainly at the beginning of the First World War. Did conscription work for us? In the past, of course, you know, when it's a war of national survival, people rally very quickly and would join. And when we talk about conscription in, in British terms, the problem the army faces today is that its offer has been eroded by decades of underinvestment. People don't want to join the army because its career offer is not what it was. Pay has fallen behind the public sector. The barracks are all very bad conditions. Some don't have central heating or proper hot water. And these are basic things which you would expect to provide an army. And if mm. we don't have these things, if we're not investing in them, we certainly can't expect people to join them. And of course, the whole career offer, and the army has always been seen as a, a good route to a, a civilian career afterwards. And that has also been eroded. And if mm. we can restore that offer, then people will join and they will be interested in it. When you, um, when you spoke to Patrick Sanders after his speech, did he say anything to you that indicated that he was brainstorming this idea of a, a gap year offer to, to students to actually try out what it's like to be in the forces? Um, no, he, he didn't, didn't mention that, but I think it's a, it's a good idea. Um, but remember, we already have CCFs in schools, Combined Cadet Forces, which allow teenagers to experience military life on a limited basis. You know, they do that once a week, and then they go to camps in the summer and uh, at other times. And we also have university officer training calls, which allow students to look at the military as well. And that's a route both to the regular army and to the army reserve. Mike, um, from the Scandinavian perspective, this, this limited national service doesn't just keep, give them bigger forces now. It also means that they have a bigger pool of people with military training were it to come to war. 
Yes, uh, but I think it's it's more a question of military familiarity than training because, I um, mean, as Nicholas will know, I mean, the skill fade is pretty quick. You know, military technology moves on very quickly, even for ground forces. And people who, you know, maybe train for, in one year don't know much about what's going on three or four years later. But familiarity and expectation management, knowing what, what is likely to be expected of you is important. You know, one of the best things I've ever heard somebody at Sandhurst say to me, he said, it's really scary what I've got to do next term when I look ahead at it, but I know that by the time I come to it, they'll have got me ready for it. That confidence that the force will get you ready for things that you can't imagine doing at the moment, that's what you're trying to inculcate in people by giving them a, giving them a, a taste, that the confidence that this is an organisation that will change you in ways that you need to be skilled when the time comes. Not that you, it gives you skills which then stay with you because actually they fade pretty quickly. I know the MOD is saying it's not on the, or Downing Street is saying it's not on the table to bring in national service, but we haven't mentioned also that the M word, the money word. I mean, if it were ever to be considered, that would be huge cost implications. And also this other idea that Patrick Sanders is, is, has been reported to be floating about uh, the gap year students, that would cost a lot of money too. I mean, any option is going to be very expensive. Yes, it is, or more expensive, certainly, uh, because, and it's not just the, the the cost of actually putting on courses or whatever it might be, or bringing people in, and the facilities. You're talking about more logistics. You're talking about supply lines. Also, I mean, if we're if we're thinking about a bigger army, you've got to think about things like, and there's some good work just starting now at Rusi on the medical services. I mean, we know that the military medical services are pretty good, but if you start to think about a much bigger army, then you're talking about the NHS again, and how good are we? What are our expectations for evacuating people from Europe back into civilian NHS hospitals on a big scale, not to the specialist military hospital, which we now got, which is fine if you're only involved in Afghanistan. Supposing you're involved in quite a lot of casualties quite quickly, can we cope with it? Answer at the moment, almost certainly not. So, you know, if you're thinking about expanding the military with a big reserve element, able to go and do something in, in, in conflict, you're also then talking about quite a lot of other things which do require some more fundamental rethinking about how we spend the defence budget or what sort of expenditures can now be counted as defence expenditures in other parts of the, the national allocation of resources. Uh, Nicholas, just to take a step back and put all of this into context and look at the, the Sweden question, if you take the benefits of national service as reported there at face value, how much of a difference would that make to the UK's armed forces and what wouldn't it fix? Well, as Elizabeth said, you know, when you have conscription, you get people joining the armed forces who might never otherwise have joined it, and they bring technical skills and, and, and other qualities that you might not ordinarily get from the general recruiting population. And remember, the UK is very generational in terms of the people it recruits. So we have successive generations of families who join the armed forces. Uh, that can give us a sort of narrow focus. So the idea of, uh, of recruiting from a wider pool is definitely very positive. And so, yes, that, that would be great. And, you know, in particular, today, we need to attract um, the techies because warfare has become um, highly sophisticated, requiring extremely advanced C4I systems and other weapon systems, which need great operator skill. And so that ability to, to attract... Uh, these specialised people with special uh, abilities is very important. Nicholas Drummond, good to have your thoughts. Thank you for joining us today. News, discussions and analysis. This is Zitrap. Since October, American troops in the Middle East have come under attack with drones, rockets and missiles more than 150 times. The strikes have been carried out by Iranian-backed militia groups but are essentially one of the consequences of the Israel-Gaza war. The response to these attacks from the US has been comparatively limited until now. But after three personnel were killed and dozens injured, Washington has promised consequences, saying there will be a tiered response. President Biden says Iran is responsible in the sense that they're supplying the weapons, but adding, I don't think we need a wider war in the Middle East. So who are the militants behind this strike and why is Iran backing them? Natasha Lynchstadt is Professor of Government at the University of Essex and an expert on the Middle East. 
This group in English goes by the name the Islamic Resistance in Iraq. They claim to be behind the attack, and it's basically an umbrella group that emerged in 2023. And it's comprised of different uh, Iran-backed or Iran-affiliated militias that are operating in Iraq. And they've claimed other attacks against the U.S. So it's a relatively new group. And Iran has many different militias that they've they've supported in Iraq. In other places, too, there's probably some six countries or more that Iran has specific militias that they've they've poured in a lot of money to uh, to to try to disrupt uh, Western interests there, of course. Um, but but this is an, a newer group that, that's that's formed. And what are these other groups that make up the so-called axis of resistance that Iran has in the region? There are a lot of groups, actually. Um, There's dozens of of major militias that they support in countries like Bahrain, in in Iraq, like I mentioned, in Yemen, in the Palestinian territories, uh, Syria and uh, Lebanon. So they, they tend to be Shiite groups that have the goal of resistance or resisting Western-backed forces or Western interests um, or Sunni groups as well. The most notable one, of course, is Hezbollah. Um, that's where Iran has, has really poured billions into Hezbollah and um, into making it a really effective fighting force, political party, uh, almost like a state within a state. Uh, So some of these groups have almost like party functions where they function with uh, like a political wing. Some of them just really have a military wing. But this is a a big business for Iran. They they really poured billions into supporting these different types of groups. Probably one of the most successful one is the Houthis in, in Yemen that have taken control over pretty much most of North Yemen. What about the dozens of smaller militias? How much military power and capability do they wield? That's really hard to say. I think a lot of these militias have the capability to disrupt. There was a case where Iran decided to provide um, some of these Shiite militias with drones, and that really changed the, the game quite a bit because they were able to exact more damage um, and with more precision on, let's say, Western, Western forces there or Western targets. So they they always have the capability of doing some damage there. Now, for Iran, it doesn't want to engage in a full-out war with the West, in particular with the U.S. So as long as these groups don't target and hit too many Americans or lead to too high a death toll, I think they're happy with disrupting and resisting Western forces there, but not escalating it to the point where you would see a full-out war. And what exactly does Iran want to get out of backing and supporting these different groups? I think there's two things. So one is exactly, as I, I just mentioned, that they're they're trying to support the resistance of these different groups so that Iran can have a greater influence in, in the larger Middle East and to expel Western forces or disrupt whatever Western forces are trying to do. So there's that aspect. But I think that you also have to look at the structure of the Iranian regime. Though it's a theocracy, it really is almost technically like a military regime. The military has become incredibly powerful. It's its own sort of entity. You have the you know, Iran Revolutionary Guards that are very powerful and the elite uh, Quds Force and the military itself. So there's a little bit of what the optics are for the military regime itself, that it, it wants to exert its influence. It wants to give it a reason for being. So it's both playing to the elites by doing these kind of things and also wanting to exert just greater military and soft power in the region. The fear, of course, is a spiral escalation. Is Iran prepared to go to war with the U.S. if that happens, do you think? So I would say no. I I don't think they want to go to war with the U.S. I mean, they're already been dealing with crippling economic sanctions. And the last thing I think that they would want would be to to engage in a massive war with with the U.S. They they can't win that. It would lead to heavy casualties. And so they're actually really careful with some of their proxies to ensure that they don't escalate things too much, that that's where it ends up. But I do think they they really want to, to push... Uh, the U.S. and the West buttons as far as they can go. It's almost like a game of chicken, but without actually going to war. So in that light, does the U.S. hold the upper hand in this situation? Not necessarily, because it's often the case that these less powerful countries 
they can just kind of engage in mischief. And Iran always uses this idea of plausible deniability that, that they never really were responsible. They never really fully claim responsibility. And there's no stopping to it because there's just so many different militias that could do different things that make things more costly, that affect supply chains, that require the West to spend much more on the military, on their presence there. And, and so if their goals are pretty limited to just doing that and, and not obviously to expunging the U.S., in some ways, these Iranian groups, backed groups in Iran has, has the upper hand. Professor Natasha Lindstadt, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, Mike, c- can the U.S. respond in a way that reduces or, or shuts down the attacks without it spiraling? It, it can, but it is, as Natasha Linsap was saying, it is very difficult for the United States because, you know, if you establish a red line, if you talk about red lines, you can guarantee that the other side will go right up to that red line once you've said it. And so the Americans don't want to say where the red lines are, but they do need to keep on responding because the Iranians and the Iranian-backed militias and the various groups that she talked about will keep on going until they get pushed back. So the United States has to react without saying, you know, this is our red line because you're giving the other side certainty as to what they can and can't do. You don't want to do that. Mm. So the U.S. is, in a sense, is on a, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. But I think the, the clear expectation is that the Iranians do not want a general regional war, but they're prepared to play games right up to the point where they think they might be at that opening of a war. And the Americans have got to try to bring them back from that moment, at that point, by reacting in a graduated way, but consistently, to try to pull them down the the escalation ladder. But you Mm. can't do it by words. You have to do it by actions. Very difficult. Of course, it's not just in the Middle East where there is a fear of conflict contagion. The idea it could happen in Europe has made more headlines in recent days because Vladimir Putin visited the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad. It is geographically cut off from the rest of Russia, meaning President Putin had to fly in along the borders of NATO countries, prompting headlines declaring it a warning or even a threat to the alliance. Whatever you make of those headlines, Kaliningrad has often been cited as as the potential flashpoint for a war. Russia expert Mark Galliotti, whose many books include Putin's Wars, has been explaining why. Kaliningrad is this odd historical offshoot. It was was Königsberg in eastern Prussia, seized by the Russians at the end of the Second World War, and held on to Russia even when the Soviet Union collapsed. So it's this small part of Russia disconnected from the mainland and instead it's on the other side of Poland and the Baltic states. So it matters particularly because exactly it nestles in to to the middle of of Central Europe. And for some people it represents a a vulnerability for Russia and at others it's kind of Russia's advanced base because it is a very militarised region. But this is it. it. It is precisely because of its location that it matters so much. And from Russia's point of view, did it take hold on Kaliningrad just as a big military base? Well, that's really what it's become. I mean, that wasn't necessarily the original intent, but this has become the only guaranteed all year round warm water port for the Russian Baltic fleet. And it certainly was, has been built up more and more as a kind of bastion of, of Russian forces. It's got long range missiles, which can, in theory at least, deny large areas of sea and airspace to NATO. And also it had at peak something like 15,000 troops based there. Now, in practice, it's really a lot less because most of the kind of ground force assets, the Marines and the like, have been sent to Ukraine. But certainly, in theory, it it certainly was a key military installation, but also a political one. Because every time Putin wants to get our attention, he decides, oh, well, we'll we'll place some nuclear-capable Iskander missiles there, and we all get worried about what that might mean. So the military and the political intertwine. And why is there a theory that if there were to be a war between Russia and NATO, it could start on the edge of Kaliningrad? It's because of the sort of much mythologized Suwalki Gap, which is this relatively narrow corridor of land, about 660 miles along, between Belarus, a separate country, but in practice really by now one of Russia's vassals, and Kaliningrad. And so the fear is that if there could be some kind of lightning push of Russian troops through Belarus and to Kaliningrad, it would cut off the Baltic states from the rest of NATO, the rest of Europe. Now, 
in in practice, this is actually something that will be very difficult to really arrange. But nonetheless, because that is a theoretical military sort of fear, that is seen as you know one of the particular areas. If Putin really wanted to strike some kind of initial blow that would put, put NATO at a disadvantage, the Suwalki Gap may be one of the places he would go for. You say that in practice it would militarily be quite difficult to arrange. If Russia did try to take the Suwalki Gap, how might they do it? And what chance would NATO have of defending it? Well, the thing is that Russia would have to move quite a lot of forces, and particularly the sort of follow-on forces, into Belarus, a place where at present there are some Russian forces, but largely we're just talking about aircraft and some security elements. So you know, we would, we would actually see a redeployment of troops. We would see a redeployment of logistics. And although pushing through the Suwalki Gap might not be that difficult, though it, it does mean cutting through Poland, and Poland is arming at a very strong rate at the moment, and particularly arming with exactly the kind of heavy armour and similar forces that are there precisely to foil a Russian attack. But once you've got there, the question is, OK, how controllable is it? Can you actually keep the Suwalki Gap open in an age of long-range standoff munitions, drones and the like? It will probably be easier to get to Kaliningrad than it would be to then hold open that channel. You've described commentary on President Putin's recent visit to Kaliningrad as overheated, but he did use it to criticise neighbouring Baltic states of removing Soviet-era war memorials. Look, Putin uses every opportunity when he travels anywhere these days to criticise the West. I mean, that's just part of his rhetoric. He went to Kaliningrad, which some people interpreted as some kind of warning to the West, but really because he's actually in the middle of an election campaign. It's a pretty low-key election campaign because we all know he's going to win, but at least he has to go through the motions. The, the whole point of the presidential elections that are going to take place in March is that they're meant to demonstrate that the Russian people are behind Putin. So there is a, a game to be played. He went to Kaliningrad firstly because it's just another part of the, of the Russian Federation that he needs to campaign in, but also precisely because it's a way of, in some ways, talking about the war without talking about the war. The war itself is not popular at home, so he can't actually sort of focus on that. But by talking about just how nasty the West is, how it's actually turning its back on the great glories of the uh, Soviet participation in the Second World War, it's a way of reminding people that Russia is in a tight spot at the moment without actually having to draw attention to all the body bags coming home from Ukraine. Uh, Mark, as things stand now, how likely do you think Kaliningrad is of becoming a flashpoint? It's one of the situations where no one really wants it to become a flashpoint. Now, as we saw, for example, at the beginning of the First World War, when tensions build up to a certain stage, there is always the risk that people overreact in response to perceived threats from the other side and, and, and events acquire their own momentum. But I think, look, at present, as I say, I think we in the West have a tendency to see Kaliningrad as this threatening bastion. When one looks at Russian military writings, it's very clear that they appreciate that actually Kaliningrad will be exceedingly vulnerable in any kind of ma major conf conflict with NATO. It would be very hard to reinforce, very hard to resupply and rearm, and in that respect would be basically stuck out there on its own. So although, yes, we can often expect it to be used uh, for political reasons, I think certainly the, the military men on both sides are very keen not to let things go beyond a certain stage. Mark Galliotti. Uh, Mike, it seems now like an historic mistake by Lithuania to have allowed Russia to hang on to Kaliningrad when the Soviet Union collapsed. Well, yeah, I mean, Kaliningrad, Konigsberg, I mean, it's one of the, because it's it's old East Prussia, Saxony. I mean, it's full of historical anomalies in European history. Mm -hmm. It's one of those strange issues that has always arisen one way or another. And I think Mark, Mark Galliotti is absolutely right. If you look at um, Kaliningrad from a Russian military point of view, you wouldn't put anything there that really mattered to you because you're going to lose it particularly mm. now that sweden and finland are in nato the baltic now belongs to nato and you can't really cut off the three baltic states anymore the way you could because now with uh, sweden and finland in nato you can supply them by sea much more easily and, you know it reminds me years ago uh, i remember sitting in norfolk virginia we were talking about cuba in relation to the united states at a time when there were lots of silly films about the russians in the 1980s 
using Cuba as a staging post for an invasion of the United States. Um, and it was, it was some really sort of daft films going around. And I remember laughing with the commander there. And he said, as far as I'm concerned, guys, he said, they can put as much as they like on Cuba because in the event of a war, they lose it all in the first two hours. And that's the way it would be for Kaliningrad. Mike, good to speak to you as always. Thank you for your time. My thanks to all of our guests. That is all for now. We'll be back with another Sit Rep next Thursday, but we've got another extra edition of the Sit Rep podcast online now. What is Strategic Command? General James Hockenhull, who leads Stratcom, explains its mission to help the single services be the best they can, why he sees himself as an accidental general and why he chose not to apply for the very top job in Britain's armed forces. That's online now at bfbs.com slash sitrep or wherever you get your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye-bye. 